So thank you all for joining us today. We're so happy to have you here for one of our free events uh, here at Village Preservation. Village Preservation, we are a nonprofit organization and we um, do these events as a part of our mission. Uh, so there are over 75 events we do every year and um, we're very happy to offer those to you. You'll see there's some opportunities to either get to know our organization, participate in our advocacy programs or donate or become a member. Um, we were founded in 1980 and we work to document, celebrate and preserve the special architectural, cultural heritage of Greenwich Village, the East Village and NoHo. So thank you all. Um, and thank you, Paula, for sharing you shared this with others. And we will be recording this evening. So please feel free, um, we will share the link. So please feel free to share that with folks afterwards. Um, what else do I want to tell you? So we have a number of events coming up in April. We've started in-person events again. So please feel free if you're in the neighborhood uh, to join us for one of those upcoming programs. We're about to launch our May program uh, schedule. So watch for that. And I will put in the chat, as I mentioned, information about getting involved with our advocacy, how to donate, how to become a member, all that good stuff. So you'll see that in the chat. And in the meantime, just let us know how you're doing, if you have any questions, and we will go from there. So that's enough from me today, because I am not the expert. We're very pleased to have Emily Robbins with us. Uh, on her mother's side, Emily comes from a Ukrainian Orthodox clerical family. Her great-grandfather, Metropolitan John, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, Emily. How do you pronounce his last name? Teodorovich. There you go. Well, I, we're very happy because we get to see some of his um, collection of eggs this evening, too. So very great. So he founded what is now the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the U.S. Um, and Emily's practiced the art of Pisanki um, since age seven. She has taught the craft since 1986 at institutions ranging from Cornell University to the Ukrainian Museum, which is right down the block from us here in the East Village. Um, and born in Manhattan, she now resides on the Upper West Side and works as an editor. And personally, I, I have gotten to know Emily because we work together at Foundation Center, which is now called Candid. Um, and I've known her craft since then. So I'm very pleased to bring it to you all. And Emily, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Leanne, and thank you for having me here today. I'm so uh, honored and pleased to be uh, sharing this beautiful craft with you. And I have such fond memories of coming down to the East Village and getting my supplies every year from the store Sorma, which used to be on 7th Street, but uh, closed a few years ago. And uh, of course, I've been to services at St. George's across the way, and I've had many, many, many pirohe at Veselka. So uh, today I'm going to give you a little background about the Ukrainian Easter egg tradition and then um, showcase some of my own work. Uh, Leanne, I think we're ready to start the slides. Let's see. Sorry, folks, give us a moment here. Would you like me to share the slides, Emily? Or? Yes, how do we do that? I will do that now. Oh, thank you. Just one moment, thanks everyone for bearing with us and we're gonna share, there we go. Okay, go ahead, Emily. Okay, so uh, welcome to this background lecture. I'm gonna start you out with uh, a little background of uh, how the Easter eggs came to came into existence. Um, so, oops, let's go back to the sun god one. Okay, so, in the beginning, before Christianity, Ukrainians believed that all life came out of a great big cosmic egg. Uh, a lot of cultures believe that. I have a list of those coming up. And because there was nothing in the universe except this egg, it, it burst forth, all life came forward. So the egg was a symbol of all life and the sun was a god. So the eggs that you see in this slide are 
pictures of the sun god. Um, very graphic, not drawing a sun the way it actually looks, but invoking the sun by suggesting his image. Okay, so ready for the next slide. Okay, here is the design up close. Uh, you can see in the middle, that's a beginner's egg. And then on the left, that's a medium level. And on the right, somebody with very fine skill has taken the design into even more detail. So the idea of this uh, image of the sun god's face is that his power just radiates out forever and ever. And the, the little white spokes of, of uh, energy uh, indicate the, the victory of light over darkness, the white over the black. And um, this is a very traditional design. I teach it all the time in my classes. It's very easy for beginners to do. And it's so wonderful to see that sun burst forth out of your dark egg at the end of the process. The egg is black and covered in black wax. And then you melt it over the flame and you see this. And there's a moment of pure joy, like Christmas morning, some people sometimes tell me of seeing that design together for the first time. Okay, next slide. Okay, so when we look at ancient religions, almost every country uh, had a, the idea of life bursting out of a shell. Here's a, I think a short list and images that reflect how they imagined the cosmic egg to be. And you can see Slavic in there that I guess uh, covers Ukraine and all the Slavic lands. Um, Pisinki are, uh, are very old. We think that sometimes, you know, maybe as, as old as 4,000 years old, uh, the slide that Leanne shows here is a ceramic egg that was found in Ukraine and dated to about the 12th to 14th centuries. It's made out of different kinds of clay and these kinds of eggs had a little rattle inside. So they made a noise when you shook them, which is strangely evocative of how Pisanki age, uh, a Ukrainian Easter egg or Pisanka, uh, when you melt off the wax, um, you've coated the egg with uh, beeswax polish, which is semi-permeable. So the egg can evaporate out through the pores very slowly and it dries up over 10 years and it leaves the little solids of the egg. And when you pick it up, it rattles a bit. So it's interesting that, that these ceramic eggs were made to do the same thing. Um, this is the oldest egg in existence found in Ukraine that references this craft. Um, there is also in the next slide, uh, a, de a design that comes from the Tripilian or Kukutani Tripilian culture in, uh, in South Ukraine. Um, and, uh, oops, we, we missed that slide. Oop, okay, they're backwards. Okay, thanks, Leanne. <laughs> um, so about, you know, 4,000, 5,000 years before the common era, um, there was this uh, farming, subsistence farming culture in southern Ukraine that made pottery with these very sinuous shapes. And um, one particular ceramic egg was found. Uh, it's in a, a museum in Lviv right now. And the decorations on it are almost identical, as you can see, to the pisanka on the bottom, which is a real egg that was written in the far west of Ukraine, the Carpathian region. Um, and that's what I mean by the collective subconscious when I talk about that in an upcoming slide, the fact that the, these eggs were made by people who were not scholars, they were made by local farm families, and somehow they retained these designs in their imagination or in their family practice, and they survived for centuries, maybe even millennia. But uh, the best source in the, that other slide, slide seven, uh, the best source is family stories, 
um, the collective subconscious of remembering those ancient patterns that are common to all cultures, um, patterns of waves and suns and moon and growing things. You know, if you look at the pattern of a Ukrainian pisanka, sometimes people will say, oh, that reminds me of African textiles or, you know, Indian batik work or Southwest American, Native American work. Um, a lot of these traditions are really common to us all. And in the Ukrainian tradition, we've had a lot of disruption over many centuries of invasion and war, but uh, the families across the world who came from Ukraine preserved this Pisanki tradition and they would share designs throughout a family. Um, sometimes a village could be identified. You know, you could look at a Pisanka and say, oh, that came from a certain village because it has this design on it. And then there's also what's going on in Ukraine right now. There are designs that people are making uh, with the trizub, the Ukrainian symbol, the national symbol that you've seen, um, and using lots of blue and yellow, which is actually technically difficult to do in the Pisanki tradition because uh, you process the egg through light to dark dyes. And if you dye an egg blue and then dye it yellow, you get green. And if you dye it yellow and then blue, you get green. So lots of technical processes are needed to uh, get the egg back to neutral before you can go from one color to the other. But there's um, Facebook groups and church groups and community groups creating tons of new designs based on sunflowers, the trizub and blue and yellow. Um, so right now in this very stressful, painful time, the art of Pisanki is responding by growing. So uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the wonderful things that happened when Ukraine became independent in 1991 is that people started to research the arts, the history, the culture of Ukraine from within Ukraine. They were very interested to learn what had been cut off from them by the years of the Soviet rule, which discouraged, <laughs> to put it mildly, discouraged Ukrainian national expression. So Ethnographers went around Ukraine and talked to families, went to all the villages and found that there were typical designs in each region of Ukraine, different styles. Um, except Crimea, this map is not quite accurate because the Crimean Peninsula was uh, populated by Turkic peoples who uh, were not Christianized. They turned in, they became Muslim when the the main religions uh, made their stake in the world. Um, Leanne, can you go to the next slide? Um, there's a little bit of a better, uh, I'm sorry, the previous one, the larger map. So here you can see a little bit more about what the designs are about. Um, if you look near Romania at the bottom, at the Western, Southwestern part of Ukraine, you can see a very detailed egg with diamonds in the middle and dark bands above. And that's the Hutsul region of Ukraine, the Carpathian Mountains, which was a culture steeped in using wood, a lot of woodworking. And their Pisanki reflected those crafts. So they were very elaborate to reflect the uh, the, the wood carving and the style of design in that region. And then if you go farther up towards Poland, you'll see uh, some designs, um, that wonderful egg to the left of the sunflowers is done with a drop pull uh, method where a, pi uh, a, a pin on a stick is heated and then the beeswax is just dripped in a very exacting way uh, so not, not using a kistka, 
like this, which is more typical throughout the rest of Ukraine. And then um, different colors, uh, different designs were typically made uh, across Ukraine. Um, there's a wonderful egg in the middle uh, to the right of the river Dnieper, which is the, the, river, the big river that divides Ukraine. And to the right of that, there's a yellow squirrels and red spirals. And that indicates the river. It's the waves of the river. Um, when you get to the Sea of Azov, you see that egg, which has something that looks like a spider on it. That actually is a stylized depiction of the goddess Berehenia, the pagan goddess who uh, was the bringer of life. So her, her arms reach out to, to give life to the world. Uh, Leanne, can we go to the next slide? All right, so all of these images, all of these designs, if you will, are actually a sort of language. Uh, the, the word pisanka actually means a written object. Um, it comes from the Ukrainian verb pisate, which is to write. So a pisanka is something that is written. And the colors and the designs both have meanings. So you can put them together and have a very specific message that you're writing on your pisanka. So uh, white, the, the main color of the egg, when you start out with an egg, it's usually a white egg. Um, that means purity and light and birth. And the contrast of white against black means you are expressing the wish for those good forces to overcome it, their opposite. So in the egg that you see in this picture to the right, um, that has that netting across that's, that's white over black, which means an expression of wanting forces of light to conquer the forces of darkness. Yellow um, means warmth, hospitality, youth, harvest, and of course the sun. So little suns were often decorated in if you see the one on the bottom the, with the red triangles, and then there's the sun uh, broadcasting its light in the darkness. And then the red uh, triangles indicate joy and happiness and beauty. Uh, that design on the bottom is called the 40 triangles, more accurately the 48 triangles. And it's a, a very traditional design that echoes the balance of life, that, that life comes into parts, four parts, three parts, you know, the three parts are birth, life, death, the four parts are winter, spring, summer, fall, um, and there are many such aspects of life that we can put our hands on. Um, this, this egg honors the order in life. Can we Go to the next slide. Um, the color orange is a very powerful color and that means endurance, um, wisdom, ambition, strength. Um, and there are a lot of uh, Pisanki that use that color. The colors of uh, yellow, red and orange are the fire colors. So because this was a uh, sun, worship or sun invocation craft originally, uh, this, those sun colors are very predominant on Ukrainian Pisanki. Um, blue is used very sparingly. I think partly because it was hard to get blue dye, um, but also because it is a cool color and it's hard to use a cool color and then go back to a warm color dye set. Uh, but blue indicated in small touches uh, wishes for good health and air, air in the house, you know, clearing the air um, and uh, was a very precious color. Okay, next slide. 
Uh, green also was rare, but uh, it indicated springtime and renewal. So that was used frequently on Ukrainian Pisinki. Um, brown meant the mother earth. And then black was not always a negative. Um, black is the opposite that makes the positive so positive. Uh, you need the dark before the dawn. Um, so the black background on Ukrainian Pisiki are about incorporating all of life. Um, it's, it's an expression of the, the origin of life from the cosmic egg and the idea of uh, the sun god bringing light out of darkness. Next slide, please. So there is actually a vocabulary of these designs that has been decoded over the years. Uh, this is from a diaspora uh, book. Um, these are the kinds of books that I grew up with learning about Pisinki. And um, these were the meanings that were handed to me through those resources. Um, so the lines, the division of the egg around the middle or around the top many, many times that indicates eternity, a lifetime. Um, when you have those waves or those sharp points, those usually mean protection. So wishing you an eternity of protection, wishing you protection over your entire life. The little dots meant wishes. Uh, and the little hatch marks mean protection. Um, the little branch, the little wavy, you know, the branch that has the little leaves coming out on either side, uh, that is a wish for strength. Um, of course, people drew crosses on their eggs after Christianity came to Ukraine in the year 988. Uh, we had uh, Prince, now Saint Volodymyr, who baptized his people in the Christian, the, the Orthodox Christian tradition uh, from Constantinople. Um, and the Ukrainian religion has, has stayed in that Eastern, um, either Eastern Orthodox or Eastern Catholic, which tends to have the same calendar uh, and some of the same liturgy, but is still under the Catholic umbrella. Um, fish meant, you know, the source of food back in the old days and referred to Christ in after Christianity because of the acronym um, of the, the message over Christ's cross was this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And in in Greek, that would be acronymized as ichthys, which is also the word for fish. Um, if you were a Ukrainian farmer and you managed to capture a reindeer or a horse, that meant that you were set for life. You had all the wealth you needed with those animals. Um, hens and roosters were very common in Ukrainian families and they were, venerated because they were, um, a, they brought, provided eggs all year round. They were a wonderful source of, of food and all birds were considered holy in a way because they, they had wings and they, you know, not chickens so much, but other birds flew closer to the sun. So they had something magical about them. Um, the rose and the star are very similar. Um, but the sun, if it has eight points, that is definitely referencing the sun. Um, flowers meant happiness. Uh, the fir tree on its own or in a band, that meant a wish for health. Uh, trees are a little bit rare, but you'll sometimes see them as a center panel of a Ukrainian pisanka with animals on either side of a tree. And that is a specific message for wishing for a long and, and fortuitous life for a family. 
and then the sieve and the basket weave and the lattice work in all those different shapes, that means projection. Um, and then if you're having a hard time seeing those uh, items, I'll, we'll go to the next couple slides which show them more in close up. Okay, so if you are going to write a pisanka at home, I highly urge you to do so. Um, what you'll need are these supplies. Um, a plate with foil on it is how I like to have my candle at home, as you can see in the, the close up. I find it very useful for having enough room for the beeswax and the, ca ca uh, the candle, and also as a, a place to rest my kistki when they're hot. I'll just leave them like that. The ones that I'm using today are uh, a Delrin handle uh, kistka. They're very easy to find. They cost about $6 each. Uh, this, the red handle is the thick. This is the medium, the blue handle, and then the white handle is fine. Um, you must use pure beeswax. Uh, the melting point of beeswax is very high, which allows you to do this craft and not, you know, you do a, a, a line of beeswax and it immediately dries, it won't smudge. And it'll sink into the eggshell and protect the color of the egg the way it is at that particular point. So for example, I've got my egg coming out of the red dye here. And those designs that are on there already, I covered with beeswax when the egg was white, when the egg was yellow, and when the egg was orange. And it's a little bit hard to see now under the beeswax, but that's the magic of a pisanka is that as you write, you hide your design. And at the end, when you melt off all the wax is when you reveal it. Um, if you try and use wax such as paraffin or soy wax, it'll smudge over the egg and it won't sink in nicely. So you must use beeswax. Um, eggs, I highly recommend you use farmer's market eggs, or if you somehow can get fresh farm eggs from a friend, that would be ideal. The thicker the shell, the better. You want a nice, smooth, thick shell that will stand up to all of these dye baths because we dye the, the egg through at least four dye baths that are fairly acid, that eats away the shell a little bit. Um, when you prepare the eggs for making pisinki, you first soak them in a bowl of lukewarm uh, vinegar water. You're using a one to eight solution of vinegar to water. You let the eggs sit in there for about five minutes until you see little bubbles all over them. And at the same time, you can see if any bubbles are coming up from the egg to the surface, which indicate a crack in the egg. So those eggs you can't make pisinki out of. So um, the vinegar that you should use is just plain white vinegar. Uh, it's always good to have lots of paper towels for wiping off the dyes. And then it's really nice to have an old rag, especially a knit cloth rag for the final process of melting off the wax. You can use a paper towel, but a cloth is gentler on the egg and it's, it's, it's a finer uh, weave to, to capture the wax with. It's also really nice to have um, some gloves like this for mixing dye, a nice tight fitting disposable cheap glove will help keep your hands from becoming like mine, all, all dye stained from all the classes I'm teaching. Um, it's also nice to have a drying board like the one you see at the top of my picture. Uh, it's simply a board with tripods of nails driven through. And um, I've got a paper towel 
on top to capture the shellac. Uh, when you finish a Ukrainian pisanka, you can um, either let them sit in a bowl and dry out. That'll take about 10 years for it to completely dry out. You have to turn it over regularly so it dries out evenly, or you can shellac them. Um, my current favorite shellac is Liquitex. Uh, it's an archival shellac. It doesn't yellow. Um, and they have a matte version as well as a shiny version. Um, so the, that's what I use my drying board, board for to, to have the, the eggs sit when they're shellacked. Um, I will put on a glove like this and dip it, you know, dip a finger into the shellac, just kind of put shellac on the egg and then put it on the, the little tripods to dry. It takes a day or two for them to dry completely and then you must empty them. If you shellac an egg, you've created a watertight seal, uh, seal and that will cause disaster if you don't empty the egg. Um, because the egg inside will disintegrate and create gases and that will force the egg out of the shell. Um, I have made that mistake over the years and learned my, my lesson. So um, back to the slideshow if we can, it seems like I lost it. Yes, okay. So, um, the first step when you write a pisanka is to have a plain white egg. You have soaked it in that vinegar water and you've let it dry. Uh, and then I like to use a pencil line on my eggs. Um, I like something to follow. Uh, and then you take that egg and you use this kistka, heating it over the candle for about five seconds when you pick it up, picked it up for the first time, and then it'll take less time to heat it up again as you work. And then I take the beeswax and I just scoop the beeswax in and it should only be half full. You can look behind the flame and see uh, how much beeswax is in there. If you see no shiny anything, that means you're out. I like to test the beeswax, how the flow is going on my foil plate. And then I will draw my design. So that spiral that I just drew, because the egg is red right now, that's gonna be a red spiral. So back to the slideshow, please. Okay, so once you have covered with beeswax, everything you want to remain white. This is the basic framework of your design, kind of like the framework of a stained glass window. Then you will dye the egg yellow. And once you have dried that, you can't have any wax go on a wet egg, so you have to dry it very carefully and pat it dry. You cannot rub, otherwise some of that beeswax might come off. Then you add all of the designs that you want to remain yellow. Um, so you can see the difference between the middle egg and the right egg, the inside of the star has been added. So the outside of the star will be white and so will be all those branches that come out of it and the inside divisions will be yellow. Then the next stage uh, in the next slide is green. And I've covered what I want to remain green on the inside of that star. And then I do orange and I've finished the inside of the star. And then I dye it red and I do the outer edge of the star. And then in the next slide, you'll see what the egg looks like after you dye it black. It has all that black dye and black beeswax it's hard to imagine that it's become what it's going to become, but when you melt off all that wax, you see that you're designed for the first time, and that's the finished pisanka on the right. If you want a close up, there's the before, and the next slide is the after. 
And that's a, a shellacked egg. Uh, you can see from the very shiny right top edge. Um, when you shellac an egg, the black tends to really have more um, presence. So for an egg that has colors like this, I definitely recommend shellacking them. Um, so next stage, please. Next slide. Uh, so this is uh, where I'm gonna show you the collection I have at home, which is very precious to me. It is probably got a range of eggs from the 1940s to just last year. Um, and they, they are the collection that I inherited from my great grandfather. Uh, my grandmother preserved them. My mother learned with me, alongside me, with me at the Ukrainian Museum, how to write Nisinki. So I have some of her collection as well. And then I have a lot of mine. Um, so I see somebody's asked uh, whether these are gifts. Um, Yes, it is very traditional to give pisinki, and the uh, pisinki that came from my great grandfather's collection were the ones that his parishioners gave him. Um, it was traditional to give pisinki to your family, to people you respected, and always some for the people in the church. So, since he was the metropolitan, he got some of the best pisinki, and. Uh, in my family, it was difficult to actually control the number of Bisinki that we had in the house because so many came in every year. Um, my grandmother had a great big basket, which I've kind of kept the tradition of with my collection there. And she had it on top of her buffet. And she told me that when my head, when I grew, so my head was taller than the buffet, I could, I could touch those Easter eggs. And it really took me a long time to grow that tall. And by the time I did, I was, uh, I was so entranced by them um, that I said to my mom, we've got to learn how to do this. And the Ukrainian Museum opened, I think around 1974, 1975. And my mom and I were in one of the first classes. Um, so somebody has asked how long it takes to complete the design. Um, if you look at the eggs um, on the right, those are mine. Uh, sorry, we can go ahead one, Leanne. Um, so the, one, the ones on the right are the ones I did so I know how long they took. Uh, the freeform one, with the tree branches, uh, that one probably took me about four hours and two hours was futzing with how, that, how to make that blue the color I wanted. Um, generally, a, a simple pisanka will take me about an hour, but then a complex one will take me up to 15 hours. Uh, somebody asked if the egg is not blown out we should use, we should not use shellac. Um, right, so I use only whole raw eggs for pisiki, both because it's traditional and also because a whole egg will sink in the dye much, much more easily. Some people do like to blow their eggs um, and they have to seal them and hold them down in the dye with special plugs and lids. Um, if you have a, uh, a blown out egg and you finish it as a pisanka, um, you don't have to shellac it. Um, it's really a, an aesthetic choice, uh, but it might be a good idea to shellac it because a, an, an empty eggshell is fragile and adding the shellac will not only make the designs more beautiful, but it'll protect it over the years. Um, and then somebody asked, is bigger better, <laughs> goose versus chicken? <laughs> um, goose eggs have, goose and duck eggs have a different texture that takes a little getting used to, but there are specific designs for goose and duck eggs um, because they're much longer. You can do much more interesting 
you know, long designs. You don't have to um, limit yourself. You can do many, many bands or, or long centerpieces. Some people even do ostrich eggs, uh, which I have not done. Um, it's challenging to use an ostrich egg because they are very large pores and you have to sort of sandpaper down the egg a bit to make it smooth enough to write with beeswax on. Um, so this, uh, this part of the, the, the pictures uh, show on the left, um, some of the Pisinki from the Metropolitan's collection. Um, the ones, the four on the left are, are from the 1940s from the Philadelphia area where his congregation was. Uh, and then the ones on the right in that picture with a lot of the pink, uh, those are my mom's because there was a lot of pink dye in, in the 1970s, a lot of pink and orange uh, were, were the colors of, of the day. So she did her, her pisinki with, with those colors. Um, Leanne, can we go to the next slide? Um, here's another look of my mother's collection at the bottom on the left, and then the Metropolitan's collection on the right. Um, I love on the right hand side, the, the right picture, lower right hand side, that uh, is a depiction of lilies of the valley. Um, that the, the artist has, has written. Um, somebody has asked about dyes. Uh, yes, they used to be natural sources. They used to be onion skins and barks and shells and berries. But I'd say about 60, 70 years ago, uh, probably in, in America, somebody formulated an aniline chemical dye for this craft that allowed the egg to be over dyed in very strong colors. Um, and that's what we've been using ever since. Uh, I've tried natural dyes and I, I haven't found the sweet spot. I, uh, I, I stick with the chemical dyes for now, but I'm very interested in learning about using natural dyes. I think that would be a lovely thing to do for the craft and for the environment. Okay, we're ready for the next slide. Um, so this is a focus on my great grandfather's collection. So you can see some close ups of the very, very fine work that those ladies did. Um, you can see why as a little girl, I was so entranced with the magic of this collection. These eggs, uh, were given to my great grandfather in Philadelphia. Um, and then they lived, they, they moved to New York City. Uh, and then they moved to my home in Brooklyn. And then they moved to my new home in Manhattan. Uh, so they've been moved four times. And, you know, we used to have four dozen of them, but we now have about eight left. Um, but uh, look on the on the right hand side, just the feather thin lines. Um, it's just just incredible and so even. It's uh, it's a, a great skill to be able to make lines that close, that smooth. And then here's one of the eggs that didn't make the move, or one of the moves so well. Um, Sadly, this egg broke in transit, but I stuff it with cotton and I turn it over and I cherish it still. It's a beautiful, beautiful pisanka. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that it didn't survive, but it's, it's still cherished. Um, and then this is uh, mostly my mom's collection. Um, she was a graphic artist. Uh, she learned illustration in art college, but uh, she was not the one in the family who got into this craft. It was me. She made a few, and these are the ones I still have of hers. Um, and she was fascinated by the medium, but I was the one who really wanted to spend all of my 
you know, spring break doing these, these Pisinki and learning how to make them better. Um, and here's another look at her, her work and a little bit of the Metropolitan's collection on the side and uh, a close-up of my mom's work. So because I have a large collection, um, probably about 14 dozen eggs, um, I have to store them um, away. I don't have them all on display. I have them, most of them in, in a closet. Um, I use wax paper or tissue paper to wrap each egg. And then I put them in a container of some kind, a uh, paper, uh, regular paper based, cardboard based egg carton is perfect. It will let the eggs breathe, which you really want to do, even if they're emptied, they still are a natural material and it's good to have air circulation possible. Uh, another thing that I have found that is very useful are tea boxes, uh, boxes designed to hold rows of tea bags. They're about the same size as an egg. So I'll wrap the eggs carefully in tissue paper and place them in those little nooks and crannies. But it's very traditional to keep them out in a basket or a plate where they have access to the air. And it's good to keep them out of direct light and definitely no spotlights or lights shining directly on them because that will of course fade them. And there's, there's my best collection still tucked away in their tea box. Um, and then here are uh, the ones that I've made over the years. Um, the one on the left picture on the bottom uh, with the curlicues and the, um, the orange points, uh, that's probably one that took me about 15 hours to make, but the one right above it, I probably was able to make in two hours because you can see the level of fineness is, is, uh, is greater in the, the, the egg below. Um, in the right-hand slide, the egg at the 12 o'clock position is a tripillion design. Uh, there is a whole wealth of designs that come from pottery and are inspired by that pottery that you can find books about. Um, they are brown and white and black. That's their color scheme to reference the pottery. And they're, um, they're beautiful designs, very mystical and, uh, you know, powerful curls and interesting shapes. Um, as you can see, it's nice to have a mix of traditional and modern uh, Pisinki in a, in a basket together. Uh, the one in the triangular basket on the right um, with the branches, the one that's at about seven o'clock, uh, that was something that I, I, I made because it's a representation of the trees coming to bloom outside my window in Brooklyn. Um, I really wanted to capture that. It's not a traditional pisanka, it's more of an egg art, but it's also a celebration of those trees. And I, I loved growing up, you know, as an adult growing up for 27 years in the same apartment, um, watching those trees come to life every year. Um, somebody asked, do I use elastic bands to make uh, straight lines? No, I do not because an elastic band is a machined thing and the egg is a natural thing. And if you try and make the egg conform to the shape of a rubber band, you're always gonna be a little bit off. So I actually draw my lines freehand and then in pencil, and then I can improve them in wax. Um, and do people in Ukraine still carry on with this tradition? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's actually being taught in schools as a school, uh, an art school subject in Ukraine, or it, it was up until February 24th. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what Ukrainians are doing right now about Pisinki, but um, yeah, it's, it's uh, part of the Ukrainian experience now. Um, and 
yeah, it's it's very important as a as a form of national expression. Um, somebody asked, uh, yes, the the country borders of Ukraine. Um, there's a wonderful joke about uh, an old man being interviewed in Ukraine uh, about his life and. The interviewer says, so where have you lived? And the man says, oh, I've lived in Poland. I've lived in Russia. I've lived in Lithuania. I've lived in Ukraine. Uh, I've lived, um, yeah, I've lived in lots of countries. And the man says, oh, so uh, you traveled a lot. And the man says, no, I've, I've been sitting in this chair the whole time. Yeah, Ukraine's borders moved a lot. Uh, there are this kind of Ukrainian Easter egg, the, the Pisanka tradition of the resist, the wax resist, uh, method, I'd say it goes into Poland and Romania uh, a good ways. Um, you know, if you had an Orthodox church within a day's ride, if you figure, you know, you would have Easter eggs like this. Hey, Leon, can we go to the next slide? Um, here are some more of my Bisinki over the years. Um, these are, these are all copies of, or, um, elaborations of cop of designs that I've seen in books. Okay, next slide, please. So I keep a lot of them in baskets around the house. Um, and, and that helps them breathe, and it's also a very nice way to display them. But for when Leanne came over, I took them out and took these pictures. Um, here's one I spent a lot of time on. <laughs> it's rare to have a, a pisanka with a blank end. Usually you put things on the end of a, a pisanka. Um, it's, it's not traditional to leave the end empty like this, but and the one egg on the left, that was a significant part of the design. And I found it very challenging to, to get the lines the way I wanted them. Um, the, the wax resist means you have to do all the white part first. So those, the tip of that egg, I covered it with a lot of wax. So uh, thinking about how far Piss and Key have gotten, I appreciated that question, but when you think about the idea of Pesinki, it really has gone worldwide. People all over the world recognize what a Ukrainian Easter egg is with the geometric patterns and the great detail. But some people think that even Fabergé was uh, influenced by, by Pesinki. And uh, it's interesting, in his first work, uh, which is in the next slide, he actually has just made a jeweled egg that looks like a real egg and the treasure was inside. He had little golden chickens and crowns and things. But um, it was only in his later work that he added stuff to the outside of the egg, which I think is fascinating. Okay, next slide, please. Um, for me, this is the real treasure. Uh, an egg, a, a Ukrainian Easter egg is, is a very precious thing. It'll last for generations if you treat it right. And uh, it's, a, it's a joy to, to make. Um, I will finish this one for you so you can see the, the melting off process. Uh, but I would like to open the floor for questions. I have a few questions that we've answered so far, but please go ahead and ask anything you'd like to know. Um, one thing I, I like to talk about is the the spiritual practice of writing a Ukrainian pisanka. Um, it's a very meditative craft and it's normally done in the evening. And it takes its own time. The wax flows at the rate it will. And the pisanka artist has to respect that. These so, curls mean protection.
So Emily, I'll lob you some questions while you uh, yes, work, please. if that's okay. And if you, if you all have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A pane. The chat works fine. Um, lots of very complimentary things to, to share with you um, in this, in this uh, chat. So thank you all for your appreciation. Um, I will say that Emily is doing a workshop for us, but it's already sold out next week. So if you're very interested in this and you want me to go back to my boss and say, hey, we want more workshops, let me know <laughs> when we send you um, the follow-up because there seems to be a lot of interest. Go ahead, Leanne, I'm just going to I'm just going to go grab the black dye for the last stage. I'll be right back. OK, great. So yes, in the meantime, more workshops. Let us know um, and if you fill out the survey, then I can go back and see if we can schedule another one with Emily. Um, and there is a waiting list. So if we, um, if we have anyone drop out and you're on the waiting list, we will let you know. I'll come back on screen while Emily's grabbing that. But um, yeah, I'm very glad we could bring this to you all and, and we still have about 15 minutes together. So. Have those questions. Obviously, Emily is a great expert. And we want to know more from her. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Um, feel free to put them in the chat. Yes, maybe we can do one in person. And if not this year, maybe next year we could we could do that. So if there's a lot of interest, maybe we can bring this back next year. Emily. Yes. Um, um, there you go. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're great. You're great. Thank you for the dye. Getting, getting the dye. Uh, so these dyes are mixed with hot water. Um, they come in powder form. You mix them up with hot water, add a couple teaspoons of or a tablespoon of vinegar, stir them until they're smooth, and then you let, must let them cool down before you put a wax with egg in, you know, a, a wig, an ax, uh, <laughs> an egg with wax all over in it because of course hot water will melt the wax. Um, when you have very detailed designs, not like this, uh, some of the more fine eggs that you saw, um, you have to really agitate the egg a bit because you have to get the dye into all of those little nooks and crannies that you've created. Somebody asked a question about uh, getting supplies. So I'm gonna share my screen and show you a list. There you go. That is a list of all the places that I know of and I have used um, to be able to get the, the all of the, the things that I needed were at Sorma, but they've closed. So the Ukrainian Museum has all of this stuff. Uh, and then there are a lot of places online that have it. Um, my favorite is the Ukrainian gift shop at the bottom. This list is just alphabetical, but the Ukrainian gift shop is, I think, the oldest store to sell Ukrainian stuff in America. And their prices are good um, and they're just lovely people. So I, I highly recommend them. Um, and no, I don't work for them. Uh, so yeah, I miss Surma. They were. They were something special, weren't they? Okay, so this is the stage where the Pisanka is representing the winter earth. All of the life, all of the color is hidden under the wax. You have to make sure it's very dry before you melt off the wax so that you don't get any black dye smudging over your beautiful design. And it's good to have a very tall candle for this process so you can see what you're doing. What you do is you hold the egg Let's see if I can get this a little farther out, closer. There we go. You hold the egg in the candle flame until you see that beeswax become liquid again. It'll take a little while and you can have the flame touch the egg 
but if you see any black smoke, that means you're too close. And then as soon as it's melted, you immediately wipe off the wax and you see your design for the first time. You have to just go bit by bit around the egg and get every little spot. And once you finish, the egg will be warm about the same temperature as a newly laid egg, which is very special to hold and feel the warmth of the egg. The egg inside will not cook during this process, but again, I'm using these aniline dyes. So this is not, you know, if the egg broke, I would not eat this egg. Um, not a good idea to eat aniline dyes. So somebody said, sometimes I get soot from the flame scorching my eggs. Okay, so I'll show you a little trick about that. Here I am scorching my egg. But what I can do now is add some melted beeswax on that scorch mark and then melt off again. And that new beeswax will pick up some of the soot, maybe even all of it. Some people do use a, a heat gun for this process. Um, I would never teach a class using a heat gun. I think that's just asking for problems. I don't mind if people use a heat gun to, to, for this stage. I just find it a lot more satisfying to use the candle. Um, I like to simplify when I make piss and key. I like to use the fewest amount of ingredients and tools. Um, so using the same candle that I used to write the piss and cut with feels right to me. But if you wanna use a heat gun, you can also put them in a slow oven about 200 degrees and then wipe off all the wax at once. Uh, very hard to empty that kind of egg though, cause they do kind of cook a bit. That is a paper, uh, paper towel that I'm using. I'm unfortunately did not bring my cloth. Uh, it's what I use, you know, if I have to, I'll use a paper towel, it's okay. Um, it's important to use a clean piece of the cloth for each wipe though. Otherwise you're just gonna get more wax back on your egg. Emily, someone asked about the vinegar soaking. Can you explain the point of pre-soaking an egg in vinegar? What does that do? Does it make it smoother, more receptive to dye, et cetera? Okay, so in, in the United States, Eggs are normally made uh, covered with some kind of protective film uh, before they're sold to keep them from going bad. Uh, the vinegar will dissolve that coating. And then if it's a farm egg that has not been treated like that, uh, the vinegar will just help to smooth the egg a little bit. But the main point of the vinegar is to prep the shell to accept the dye. Uh, I don't know exactly why it works, but using the vinegar to, to clean the eggs makes, makes the shell a lot more receptive to the dyes. And Emily, someone asked, did, did the ladies, I know when we, when we chatted, you were like, there could be men who did this too, but it was mostly ladies traditionally who did it. When they created the eggs as individuals, do they do it as individuals? Was it more like a quilting bee? Was it a social event? Do you know a little bit about that? Yeah, well, most, uh, most farming families had many female members and they would sit around in the evening and do this together. And the older women would teach the younger women. Um, there was also a certain housekeeping aspect to this. Uh, this was considered a blessing for the house that, that people would make, would write Pizinki at night in the house. You were supposed to prepare for this spiritually by cleaning the house, making a good meal for your family. I love this one, no gossiping. 
and uh, basically being pure of heart and intent. And then you would sit down and you would write your piss and key with your family. Um, I think in modern times, it's probably more of a church group thing. Um, I'm actually in Baltimore right now and I'm teaching church groups how to do this. Uh, one of my friends is an Episcopalian priest. So I'm teaching Episcopalians how to write piss and key. That's so at the beginning, uh, you, thank you for remembering. What I'm basically doing is I, I'm spreading beeswax over this egg. As I, as I melt it off, I'm kind of buffing the egg with beeswax. And that's what creates my semi-permeable seal. Uh, that's what makes this egg able to sit in a bowl and slowly desiccate over decades. Um, if you imagine an eggshell pour looking kind of like this, you put melted beeswax into it, and as the beeswax dries, it shrinks. So there's a little air around that beeswax plug. So that's how the egg evaporates. And in the old days, they would polish the egg with any fat they had their hands on, you know, animal fat um, was probably the most common one. And uh, they would be kept not just in the house, but it was just traditional to put some in the barn to protect it and, and to protect the animals there uh, in the fields so that the fields would produce um, and given to everybody that you knew to, to protect them. They were also used as courtship um, tools. Uh, a young woman would make a pisanka for, her best pisanka would go to her favorite guy. And if he accepted it, then the game was on. All right. So here we have my newest pisanka. And this was, was written with intent for Ukraine. The white is order out of chaos. And here is strength. And these combs mean putting things in order. They mean sorting out the good from the bad, like a rake would in a, in a farm. So here is some wise raking the good away from the bad. And then these curls, of course, are passionate wishes for protection. So it was, uh, it was wonderful to, to be able to do that for you. I uh, probably make about six to a dozen piss and key every year. It really depends, but this year it feels like it's gonna be a big year. There's, there's more need. Uh, there's a wonderful old story about the need for Pisanki being uh, that evil was actually a creature chained to a rock at the end of the world. And he had little minions who would go around the world and count the number of Pisanki written every year and come back and report to him. And if more were made, his chains would tighten him to the rock. And if fewer were made, they would loosen. And if the minions came back and said, sorry, nobody wrote any piss and key this year, then evil would say, yay, and his chains would break and he'd run rampant all over the world. So that is why we need to make more and more piss and key to make sure that the world is protected from evil. I think um, that's a, oh, go ahead, Emily, sorry. Nope, that's it. I, I was going to say that's a beautiful way to end unless we have any other questions. Um, and we we see some very pro-Ukraine things in the chat, which feel free to share. I yes, think yes, Slava Ukraina. Yeah. Um, and, and just to bring it back kind of to our community, uh, sitting here in the East Village, you know, there's there's a lot going on for people here. So we thought maybe this was one way to celebrate culture. Um, a culture that is literally under fire right now that we wanted to share with you all. So thank you for joining us today. Um, 
Very nice comments in the chat. A lot of beautiful comments. Someone I just wanted to raise up. Someone said your grandmother would be proud, Emily, from the from your work. And I got a little teary and I think that's true. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, she was a, a lovely lady. Her craft was embroidery, but uh, she would have been terrific at this and if she'd taken her hand to it. Great. And uh, yes, Antonia uh, Slava Heroim as well. Lots of hero at this point. Great. So thank you all for joining us. I think at this point, unless there are there any last thoughts you'd like to share, Emily, before we go? Please write Pisanki. You know, it's uh, it's Western Easter coming up. Um, and then there's another week where Orthodox Easter is. It's a week later this year. So you have plenty of time. Um, please, please write Pisanki. It's a beautiful craft. Uh, I promise you, you'll get addicted if you try it. Well, thank you, Emily, and um, love that writing forever is a nice way to end. So thank you all for participating. Uh, things When I hit end, we all just go away. So I want to leave you with thoughts of happiness, strength, and peace, and have a great evening. Take care. <laughs>